Hey, welcome back to our series on church authority abuse. This is part seven. Uh, there's going to be two or three of these on constituency meetings. This time we're going to look at constituency meetings in general. I have my constituency packet for my upcoming constituency meeting. And what is a uh, what is a conference constituency meeting about? Let's consider a statement here over here on uh, the first page or so. The purpose of the blank session is to consider the growth and advancement of the gospel in blank during the past blank years and to establish plans and policies for the advancement of God's work in the future. This includes the election of conference officers, president, secretary, and treasurer, departmental directors, executive committee members, and constitution and bylaws committee members. The session will also consider proposed changes in the bylaws and conduct other necessary business as noted in the agenda. So every four or five years, your conference, your sisterhood of churches, that group holds a constituency meeting. And in that meeting, it elects officers and makes other decisions about how God's work will proceed in your area. Now, some have treated these kind of meetings with indifference, but I want you to know these are especially important because of their infrequency. They usually only happen every four or five years. So that makes each meeting that much more important. At these times, workers in the conference office especially remember those to whom they are directly accountable. Now, all the conference membership is encouraged to attend, but only those who are delegates will be able to vote. So a constituency meeting is member voice. Remember, we talked about that in part four. Member voice happens either directly through your direct vote or indirectly through delegates or representatives that you elect. In a constituency meeting, that is exactly what is happening. Your people are speaking for you. Your voice is going to make decisions on behalf of God's people in your conference. You know, we treat elections in our local congregations pretty seriously because, you know, the people we elect, they're going to be in office for, you know, one year or two years, and that's going to dramatically affect all the things your church is doing. Uh, but at the conference level, you know, we're just another scale higher. We're dealing with the whole system of churches, and now we're looking at a period of, of m multiple years, four years, five years. You know, but what can one person do? Well, one time I was in a constituency meeting, actually, and one of my church members was one of the, we were all delegates, and an item was up that needed a two-thirds vote to pass. And so they took the vote, they calculated the vote, they came up and the chairperson said, conference president said, it is passed. And my member leaned over to me and he said, pastor, he says, this requires a two-thirds majority there, and this is not a two-thirds. I said, hey, you might want to stand up and make a point of order because if nobody says anything, they're going to get this change anyway. So he did, and they checked, and he was right, and the president had to announce uh, to the constituency meeting, by the way, this item we said had passed actually hadn't passed. It required a two-thirds majority, and we didn't have that. So one, one person, one delegate, one person did their duty, and it was good, by the way, that that item didn't actually pass. So one person can make a difference there just by holding people tight to the rules rules that they themselves have agreed to. Well, let's ask a question, who are the delegates? So there's two kinds of delegates. Number one, there are regular delegates. And number two, there are delegates at large. So the regular delegates are delegates that have been based on the membership and so on of the different churches. Those are lay members, those are members of the churches, and those have been voted by their congregation to serve as delegates. They're there representing the, the congregation to the sisterhood of churches. Then you have members at large. Member at large are usually credentialed employees of the conference. So that'll be your conference officers, your president. Uh, that'll be all the pastors in your conference. It'll also include usually the union president, some of the union officers, and maybe some other, two or three from other institutions in your conference, like a university or something. So what's the ratio on this? Well, I'll just tell you the ratio with the most recent one in our conference here. Uh, we had 348 regular delegates when the meeting came to order. There were 170 delegates at large. Uh, they voted three churches into membership, and then they voted their delegates into uh, validity. And so anyway, by the time this was done, there were, what, uh, 546 uh, delegates altogether. So regular delegates outnumbered the delegates at large by a ratio of more than three to one. So let's just kind of give you a flavor for what's going on. Now, some delegates are also designated as organizing committee delegates. Who, who are they? What are they doing? So they usually meet uh, just before the session in some way, and they meet and they do two things primarily. They, uh, they determine who's going to be nominated to serve on the nominating committee for the constituency session and who's going to be nominated to serve on the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. 
Now, like all other members, they have their own voting rights, but they often will miss out on some of the activities, some of the voting, because they may be meeting as an organizing committee in another room while the rest of the delegates are doing the other business that's already on the agenda. But they won't get too far without the organizing committee because the organizing committee uh, appoints the nominating committee, and the nominating committee is the one that's going to go ahead and suggest officers to be elected, the president and, and the treasurer and so on. But what are some of the roles? You've heard me talk about the chairperson before, or the chair, they just call him the chair. The chair is usually the conference president. Part of the meeting will be the union president. The chairperson helps the meeting process agenda items, and he also will rule on points of order. So if somebody comes up and says, you know, makes a, a, an item there and say, well, on a point of order, this should have been a different way, the chairperson will make a ruling on that, and usually that's what stands, but I'll tell you what, we'll talk about it not, not today, but next time in number eight. Uh, but you can challenge that if you feel like the ruling of the chair, chair is wrong. Uh, there's a way, there's a motion you can do to take the authority away from him to make the decision. And the whole body can make that decision. It's not a reflection against the chair. But just know that the chairperson does not have the last word. The constituency body has the last word. Now, there's another person that is usually appointed, always appointed, basically, is somebody who's called the parliamentarian. The parliamentarian is an expert in uh, the, the different things, the church manual, the rules of order and all that. We'll talk next time about rules of order, Robert's rules of order, general conference rules of order. That'll be number eight. But today we're just kind of throwing out some of the general pieces. Now, the chairperson will sometimes seek the advice of the parliamentarian. He doesn't, he's not required to follow it. He often does. But again, this is the chairperson's prerogative, and so that's another key person that will be engaged in what's going on up front. So let's look at something over here on page 120. Nothing of a political nature should be allowed to come into this work. There's an interesting line, because look, we're talking about a constituency meeting. Every system of representation is inherently political in that it involves people and governance. Anyone simply looking up the definitions of these words must automatically recognize this. And yet every manual ever published by the church has always said, let nothing of a political nature becoming, be happening here. How can we do nothing political in an endeavor which is entirely political? So as Christians, our outlook on this is not the same as secular politics. Our outlook includes a spiritual aspect. We seek God's intervention in constituency sessions because we, we want it. We want to know his will. We want to know what he wants. We want him to influence us. We want him to influence other delegates. We want him to influence the chairperson and everybody who's engaged. We, we have the broader uh, picture. There are angels present. There are good angels present. You know, there are... God is on his throne, and this meeting is to flesh out in a stronger way how we're going to do ministry in the, in the days and years to come. So... So we seek God's intervention. It's not just a regular political, secular political meeting. So because Christians are in the meeting, because uh, holy angels are in the meeting, because the Holy Spirit is influencing hearts, we, we anticipate that God is doing something uh, different here. This is not just the same as some political convention. So it's not true that a constituency meeting is purely political, not at all. In fact, you know that every church board meeting, every church business meeting, they all should have a worshipful tone, a spiritual tone, and they should be spiritual meetings. Realize that as from coming from the Christian perspective, we are expecting God to intervene. Keep that in your mind as we're thinking about all this. So remember, a conference constituency meeting is a lot like a church business meeting. It's just on the conference scale, just a bigger scale. Now, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be present. But God makes no guarantee that every heart will be influenced, that every heart will be softened, and there are no guarantees that everything's going to turn out the way we want it, you or I want it, or are determined, or think spiritually it should turn out. But you know what we do? We trust God, we have faith in Him, and we accept the limitations of the process. In our fallen world, everything that's human is imperfect. And a constituency meeting involves a, a, a lot of humans. Now, it's not difficult to infer from the, the manual why we shun everything of a political nature. We don't want that in our meetings. Why? First, notice that the warning in the manual is offered in the context of delegate selection. Since delegates represent the voice of the membership, nothing manipulative, nothing uh, controlling or illegitimate should happen 
uh, while they're being selected. The process should be fair. Now, also, the wording of the very first church manual in 1932 will help us with this. Let me share that wording with you. This is from page 11, the 11th page of the first church manual. Listen to what they said. Nothing that savors of a political convention should be allowed to come into this work. What work? Well, the work of, of selecting delegates. Now, the manual contains uh, some further insight that will help us with this question of political. So I'm looking at page 121 and listen to this uh, paragraph. It is not permissible for church or conference delegations to organize or attempt to direct their votes as a unit, nor is it permissible for the delegates from a large church or the conference to claim preeminence and directing affairs in the conference session. Each delegate should be susceptible to the direction of the Holy Spirit and vote according to personal convictions. Any church conference officer or leader attempting to control the votes of a group of delegates would be considered disqualified for holding office. So block voting, party line voting by groups within the church, that is, that is pretty clearly forbidden. The delegates are expected to vote according to individual thought, according to their individual conscience. They're not to be combined into power blocks. They're not to be bullies or be bullied. They, uh, we respect that God has, may have something to do or say through each individual. So because of our Christian perspective, we say nothing of a political nature should happen here. So to summarize, participants should shun everything of a political nature. We should avoid it. We should avoid the development of a party spirit. We should avoid any illegitimate attempt to, uh, to manipulate outcomes. Instead of cleverness, we exercise faith and trust. Instead of bribery or influence peddling, we conduct ourselves with integrity because we're Christians. See? Faith doesn't make vigilance unnecessary, but it certainly makes integrity necessary. And integrity should mean that we follow the church manual guidelines on elections. We should follow it to the letter. So keep that in mind in all the things your church does in your constituency meeting, in your conference. Follow these guidelines quite carefully. What's interesting in, in recent time is that accusations and name calling have become very prominent in our world. Uh, accusing people and has become a big deal, a big thing. And it's that way in the secular world. And we should be very clear-minded so that these methods don't become useful in the church either, because somebody who doesn't like your opinion on a certain doctrinal position or something, they may accuse you of being political. And we don't like your guest speaker. We don't like your haircut. We don't like your stand on uh, this issue. You're, you must be political. You know, you don't like our conference guidelines. You must be political. Don't be cowed by that. Don't, don't be manipulated by that. Don't respond to that. Uh, if they want to charge you with being political, you know, let them chatter all day long. But you know what? You just make sure you're not political and uh, follow the rights and, and obligations the church has laid out. And, and we're going to be fine here. But don't don't be uh, don't be name called and uh, don't be bombed into submission by these kind of accusations. Don't let people do that to you. They'll try. Don't let them do that. Being interested and engaged in the work of the church is not being political. It's 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 being spiritual. And we're here to try to do God's work. Now, a combination of factors has done something in the church that is uh, problematic. Presently in the church, there are mutually exclusive theological positions. There are differing views concerning church governance and the relationship of the world church work to the local church work. And I'd say on the internal conflict scale, the ICS scale, as I call it, we, we, we're, we're at level three. You know, level one of the internal conflict scale, you might say, well, we agree to disagree and we, we, we tolerate each other. We just disagree. Level two would be, uh, we disagree pretty strongly, but you know what? Your church has got a lot of baptisms. Your church has good tithe. Pragmatically, we're just, we're going to just hold on and let it go. But, but level three is active current suppression. So we're at an, we do have an internal conflict and we're at the spot where some are are definitely working to actively suppress other people. Some are attempting to preserve denominational distinctives and the authority structure where the authority rests in the membership of the church, while others are trying to decentralize that. They want to uh, move doctrinal authority to kind of a localized conference or union level and make all these decisions at that level. So there's a fragmenting uh, movement that is on. And there's an attempt to replace our church governing system where uh, the authority rests in the membership and it kind of goes up from there. Now there's some some who want to bring in authority in the middle. They want to bring in authority in the unions and in the conferences and press down on the people 
and force their way, force their preferred uh, guest speakers, force their preferred practices and doctrines. And they're trying to bring in and exert this authority from the middle. So that's that's kind of a problem because that will change our church very dramatically. So what do we do in that kind of case? Well, we we operate within the uh, agreed principles of the organization. So that means we follow working policy. We follow the church manual. We, we of course, are seeking to be consistent with all the inspired writings of the Bible. What else do we do? We seek to elect theologically faithful people, sound workers who adhere to the church governance plan that our church has chosen. And we do all this trusting God and acting within the boundaries of integrity. You may say, well, what if the other side cheats? What if the other side does dishonesty and so on? We just make sure that we have integrity. The Lord takes care of a lot of things that get weird. So we can trust him and keep our conscience clear and do what's right. And God will bless that. So, you know, we take the long approach and we recognize that there's a lot of challenges in the church. It's going to take years to put in leaders who are more faithful to the church governance system we have. So just plan. It's going to be a longer term thing. But, you know, take a, take a deep breath. Unless God chooses, we probably won't see any sudden instant fixes, but we're going to be slogging on and being faithful, and the Lord will bless that. Now, maybe you want to communicate with some of the other delegates before the constituency meeting, and you know, you are free to do that, but the conference doesn't do much for you to encourage you to communicate with other delegates. I, my packet here, I've looked at this uh, material, and uh, I didn't even find a list of the delegates here. So there will be a list of delegates, but probably not until the last minute. So the conference isn't going to really help you communicate with each other. I think they're trying to uh, fulfill that desire to avoid anything of a political nature. But you will know some of the delegates perhaps in your own church, and you may know some from other churches, and it's not illegal to speak to them. Although you shouldn't be planning any block voting, just as we already talked about, nothing like that at all. The issues that are before your conference and its constituency meeting it's perfectly fine to try to find out more information about those issues and uh, think about it wisely about, about those issues. But you're going to have to be pre-networked with everybody if you're going to have any kind of communication. So it's not an absolute thing you need, but it, it, a lot of us would like to have it. We understand why they don't encourage that. Now, here's a question a lot of people have had, and I think it needs to be addressed. Some have assumed that credentialed workers or their spouses will automatically vote to support the president or the leaders that are already there. But remember, these are going to be electronically tabulated. These are going to be more secret ballots. Basically, there would have to be corruption on a very large scale for people to find out who voted what. So they really don't have to vote. People don't have to feel they're under great pressure to vote with uh, the, the current leaders they have. In fact, I want you to know that sometimes the leaders feel a lot of concern. They work directly with these people. And if they're not acting in a, a godly or spiritual way, sometimes they quite regret some of the things that they wind up uh, seeing face to face. And you know, some of the people who are voting against these people continuing in their position very often will be some of the people who work right next to them in the conference office. I mean, I know, I know there are cases like that. So don't just feel like, oh, these guys are pastors. They might lose their job. They feel they might lose their job if they don't vote for the conference president. Now listen, at the constituency meeting, the conference president is the one who might be fired. So just keep that in mind. Don't uh, The people are not there uh, trembling and, try and, and feeling like I have to vote this way or I'm going to I won't be able to pay for, for cat food. It's not the way it is. Now, here's another problem in the same line. You know, conference workers, they're already kind of at least informally networked together, right? So, yes, that's true. They know each other's email address. They, they know they talk to each other. They may walk down the hall and visit each other in the office. Of course, they're working. They're doing the work of the conference, of course. The potential for coercion doesn't guarantee coercion. In God's church, we don't operate based on suspicion. We don't operate based on coercion. But now let's consider the worst case scenario. Somehow, in spite of all the different checks and balances, somehow there is corruption of some kind. What then? Well, guess what? God is in heaven and we're on earth, right? In the worst case, God in heaven has a, has a view of the facts and he can overrule if he chooses. We shouldn't despair because there could be collusion or there could be, there might be corruption. Oh, well, yeah, we're on earth in a fallen world. Those things could be. We should actually, though, heed the inspired counsel. Christian service, page 110. This is so important. He will do his part when we in faith do ours. He will do his part when we in faith do ours. We can trust him. 
Uh, you think you're concerned about how the conference or the constituency meeting works out. Well, guess what? God is sort of invested in that too, right? I mean, it's his church. So yes, God has his eye on what's going on. If we'll be honest, too often the fact will be not that not that God didn't do his part, but that we we just treated it too indifferently. We weren't we weren't bold enough. We didn't care enough. We didn't treat it seriously enough. We didn't do our research. You didn't read the constituency report before you went to the meeting. You didn't know what was being talked about. Something weird happened. And whose fault is that? If we'll be honest, a lot of times it's going to be our fault. So let's make sure that doesn't happen. Now let me share something that I found to be very interesting. In the earliest years of our church, go way back to the beginning and guess what? We were formed in 18, the general conference is formed in 1863. This conference is the oldest conference. I'm here in this conference, which was formed in 1861. In the very earliest years of the, the groupings of our church that became conferences, do you know how often constituency meetings were held? Well, and the answer is annually, every year. They had a they had a general conference session every year. They had constituency meeting every year. And after a while, they changed that so that it was every two years. So every year or every two years, the leaders would be evaluated by the members. There would be voting and people decide, do we want this guy to continue to be our conference president? Do we want this person to continue to be the conference secretary, the conference treasurer? Do we still want this person in religious liberty? Do we still want this person in personal ministries? And nowadays, in many conferences, it is five years, five years apart. If you survive the vote, you get to go for five more years. My personal belief is that leaders will behave more accountably if they're up for re-election every two years or every three years. So a constituency meeting every two years or three years, that's going to cost more than doing it every five years, but it would keep people more accountable. So anyway, just, just a thought, just something I thought you might find interesting. They used to do it annually. Hey, remember, we don't elect officers in our local congregations every for, for a period of five years. We elect them at one year or maybe two. Well, in conclusion, let me say this. Constituency meeting, in a sense, is judgment day. Conference leadership is hired or it's dismissed. Member voice is spoken through representative delegates and others. Friend, the church should take constituency meetings very seriously. You're going to affect the people that are put in those positions. You're going to affect how the church does things for the next period of years. So what are we coming to? Well, part A, next time, I want to give you a better understanding of voting, of parliamentary procedure, and I'm even going to arm you with certain motions, motions that you can make in a constituency meeting that would give you potential to perhaps correct something that's happening in a meeting that's sliding over in the wrong direction. You need to know some bits on how you can make a difference. All right, let's try again here.